Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Audible. I'm just uh, trying to see if I can, um, you know, share my uh, PPTs. So, what do I do? Uh, you please, sir, click on share screen button. Share screen is where? Where is the below? This? I think there's a green button next to chat. Yeah. <laughs> next. Where uh, so all. Oh, no. And um, their screen. Yes, sir. Uh, down there, it will be there. Uh, just down in the uh, share yes, screen sir, there yes. with green, More green color. Participants, record this, record this. Uh, uh, you will uh, see it near the record. Near the record, record, yes, that's sir. what I'm trying to search. Um, record this uh, on this computer. Record to you the. You don't need to record. You will just click on share screen. Where I'm not getting the share screen. I'm not getting the share screen. Share screen is uh, somewhere here. You uh, just click on the screen, and I think then you will be visible. Mm -hmm. So in folder, oh. no, I'm not getting the share screen. So oh. you were Sir, did you see? Yeah. My so you can is up next yes. to chat chat button. If you can see your chat button, that's a Sorry, green. Um, that's what if I make it uh, full screen. Yeah, I think you, you should do that. Yeah. Full screen reactions record share screen. Yeah. Yes. Sir. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> you click on share screen. Yeah. Can you can you see, see it now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can yeah. see some. It's okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, you can start now, I think. It's time to start. Just a second, yes. just a second. Let me set it off. Something is not uh, you are sharing screen. Okay. Mm, yeah, we, I, I I can view your your screen from this end. Actually. Yeah, but uh, yeah. <clears throat> I think I have opened it twice. Okay. Ah, but it, it looks fine at this end. Maybe two screens I have opened. These are all. Uh... Yeah. <clears throat> oh, no, at, at my end it's on, it's only showing one screen and on the. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Side. Maybe you just need to click on so it's, uh, you know, slideshow sign and then it, these slides on the right hand you side. You may also uh, tap on the F9 uh, in your keypad. F9. Tap. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Integrate to webcam. F9 tap. Uh, sorry, F9. Will... F9. Yes, sir. Yes, Control sir. F9. Yes, sir. It will analyze the screen. Yeah, I did that. Participants, sorry, something your screen is sharing. How do I enlarge my screen? You may also click on the slideshow. Isn't it all right? Microphone speakers. Record this, copy this. All everything else is coming other than what I want to. <laughs> yeah. You just click. Uh, you just uh, click on F9 tip. F9. F9. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Control F9 or Control F9. I think only F9. Only F9, nothing is happening. Can you please try control F9? Okay. But it's not working. My that uh, okay, maybe maybe I can do it here. So great. Uh, can you see the uh, stop video pin video brightness button. bar? Uh, Hello? So, great video. 
so you can see me and uh, see the slides also na no? yes sir we can see ah okay 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 so i think uh, so small active speaker video okay okay i think let me uh, remain like this yes sir and i don't know um, speakers at phone uh, system sorry if you can do one thing if you have any problem in screen sharing you can yeah. mail us from our side you can do it sir no now now you can see the screen now you yes, are looking and uh, it you can okay see me that. also you can yes, see sir. me also yes yes sir yeah okay i think i think let it be i think uh, yeah, it is yeah. looking larger to me so i am ready for the starting so now we can start yes sir yeah okay okay yeah please a uh, good afternoon everyone respected chair person respected guest and esteemed participants i bondita borbora coordinator of this workshop on behalf of entire organizing committee welcome you all to this valedictory session of this week long workshop on governance and development issues and challenges organized by center for ethnic studies and research guwahati in collaboration with indian council of social science research nerc shillong with two associated institutions the department of political science morithal college themazi and sinamura college jorhat uh, with an objective to learn and to introduce new ideas and thoughts from experts of different fields on the issues of governance and development we have conducted this week long workshop a number of research persons both national as well as international level and 73 participants from different states of india have made this objective fulfilled uh, it is said that an hour spent in the company of a scholar is worth reading a 100 books and from discussion on different issues in total 16 technical sessions we also have learned and experienced many more new things after such six and half busy days now we have come to the valedictory session of our workshop and for this session we have invited dr kukan sandra das sir uh, associate professor and head of the department of political science assam university dipu campus as our chairperson dr r k sotpoti sir the honorable director of icssr nrc as our chief guest and dr rp pathan sir associate professor of the department of humanities and social sciences bits pilani gua campus as our guest of honor and especially professor db uh, subedi sir as our special guest for this session and he is the faculty of humanities arts social sciences and education university of new england australia all of them already have joined with us and i welcome all our esteemed uh, guest uh, to this valedictory session now i request dr kupan sundra das sir to preside over this virtual session uh, dr das sir kupan das sir can you hear me oh good thank yes sir Can you hear me, sir? I think, sir, is facing some network issues. Sir, please unmute yourself. Who can do, sir? Oh, oh, yes, sir. Hey. doctor uh, borbor and uh, respected organizers uh, respected dignitaries resource persons and guest of honor and participants of the international workshop on the uh, I think Star is facing network problem. Yeah, but 
so i would like to um, continue our session as per our agenda and uh, kupan chandra das sir he will join us very shortly we hope and as per agenda i request our chief guest professor r k sarpathi sir um, the honorable director of icssr nrc to speak his observation and valuable give his valuable comments regarding this workshop and i am very happy to inform you that the uh, rk sarpathi sir was also present in our inaugural session so we are very eager to uh, hear from sarpathi sir about our workshop uh, professor sarpathi sir you please thank tell you for your presence yes sir thank you very much uh, uh, yes uh, Uh, it's rather my pleasure rather to uh, be there uh, in both uh, inaugural as well as valedictory address. And I was thinking that uh, perhaps uh, someone else should have been there. But yesterday uh, when uh, and Dr. Das, he uh, informed me about uh, these things. I was a uh, bit because he himself is also not keeping well. So because of that, I, I thought that I shouldn't uh, disheartened him. so that's how i uh, thought anyway i also i had expressed my views my idea of governance as well as uh, uh, development the issue of development uh, i hope that uh, uh, this uh, one week long uh, workshop might be uh, uh, a big success because participants who are there from different countries resource persons also who are there from different countries so it will be i uh, it might have been a very very enjoyable uh, week long uh, workshop and also it might be a great learning experience for all the participants so i thank all the organizers uh, organizers for that but coming to this again i just uh, to have my concluding uh, observation and a remark about uh, uh, that governance and development what i can say is that I believe in one thing uh, that uh, the development, uh, the very very fundamental question which is asked, development for whom? Who are meant for whom? The people generally, the general public, for whom these developmental measures are being done, either by the state or by any other organizations. so they themselves must be the important participant in any decision making body otherwise it will be some sort of as i coin this term authoritarian democracy in any democracy the the, the most important stakeholders are the public so when public they themselves will not decide what is good for them who is this government or any other organizations to thrust upon any development agenda upon them uh, there are two different theories relating to that one important theory says that uh, the the state knows better than the individual so state can know what is good for the individuals which with finite and limited uh, uh, i can say that uh, 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 sense of judgment they cannot decide what is good for them but the other one which is more acceptable and which is more democratic is that the individuals himself because uh, be having a some sort of liberal mindset i always believe that the person concerned must decide what is good for him and for that purpose any development which takes place there has to be a some sort of forum in which he can express freely about his opinions and for that i always advocate about two forms of democracy one is deliberative democracy and another is participatory democracy deliberative democracy i again borrow my uh, idea uh, from this uh, jargon habermas who speaks about public sphere in that case in deliberative democracy two conditions must be met the 
the first condition is that each and every individual they must participate on equal terms there should not be any uh, imposition or some sort of influence of status position either financial political or social these things must be avoided to the best possible extent so from that point of view any deliberation first condition must be that they all must be treated as equal when there will be deliberation on any issue second important aspect is that which is uh, most likely uh, these bureaucrats also they try to do that way uh, that uh, mostly they see that in the name of technicality they try to keep most of the discussions away from the public for example uranium mining whether it is good for good or bad so whatever few scientists and through this manipulation of uh, print media or electronic media they used to say that this is good for the public or this is harmful for the public and accordingly opinion is formed that thing must be avoided to the best extent possible each and every issue must be deliberated freely and there has to be free flow of information to that so these two conditions must be met second important aspect i told about the participatory democracy in a participatory democracy there are again liberal way of thinking and marx that uh, marxist way of thinking i will not go into the details about all these things though marxists they believe that participation through various organizations associations all those things will be there but i believe that participatory democracy means at the grassroots level maybe at the level of the village or a panchayat or at the district level in each at each and every level people they must take part to know what are their priorities where there should be development how development must take place even not only that in the development process also they must be involved because we have seen so whenever supposing any road construction supposing is going on in each and every village if this a lot public will be there of that village they will not allow the contractor to cipher away money they will not allow generally to do any mischief so it is meant for them so they must to play the most important role so in such cases what will be the role of the state what will be the role of democracy the role of the state will be just like facilitator the state will be the facilitator so uh, and uh, as i told even in my uh, that uh, last inaugural address also i told the same thing i don't believe in any vertical model of development i want horizontal model of development as well as the governance all must in a democracy all of us are equal we have elected our representatives for few years or for few months but that is our choice that is our wish and unfortunate part is that we don't have any 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 you can say recall system in our uh, indian democratic system uh, otherwise perhaps had this been followed we would have recalled most of our representatives as non performers as non performers and as you know that uh, supposing this each and mla each mla and mp they were given some sort of funds to to spend in their uh, uh, these things and the the um, uh, survey says that this money it was not spent properly so we entrust this responsibility to our respective mlas and mps but they don't behave responsibly who is to be blamed and in any democracy as i told you only thing is that we need an aware public a vigilant public it is the public only who can set the things right whatever model you follow we have adopted the best form of democracy parliamentary democracy our constitution is is one of the best constitutions in the world 
but still there are many weaknesses there are many loopholes in our democratic system it is because of that this is meant for this our form of constitution or democracy is meant for the most vigilant and most politically conscious public and when a person can be purchased and sold with a cup of tea at the time of election and he can we can buy uh, someone's vote through different means at that time we cannot expect that our democracy will be the most meaningful democracy so for that as a student of political science also and otherwise as a as a as a conscious uh, social scientist i believe that we all educated people we need to sensitize the public in our respective areas so that they can be a better public there will be more responsive and responsible public that's what only i can wish so with that i i again uh, have my best wishes of course and again uh, as it is mostly confined to uh, northeast uh, region i can say uh, that uh, um, icss or nrc is always there to help people those who want to do any genuine research or genuine study we are always there to support them we are always there to help them and any help they require for a genuine work please you can feel free to call us and we will be there to help <coughs> thank you very much uh, thank you professor satpathi sir for your valuable speech we did a very short period of time you have explained very well about especially participatory democracy and deliberative democracy and the relationship between democracy governance and development uh, we are very thankful to you especially because of your support and cooperation towards this workshop and we hope that uh, you and your institutions will have your support and cooperation with us in our future and diverse too thank you sir uh, now uh, we have with us dr rp pathan sir as guest of honor for this session and sir is present among us and dr pathan sir is associate professor of the department of humanities and social sciences bits pilani goa campus his areas of interest are international relations migration and labor market international trade and development development economics as well as maritime studies and blue economy he has been member expert for the commonwealth fellowship for economics for hansel has also received rogelio sinan award from the embassy of panama in india now i request sir to deliver his speech and to present um, before us uh, on the topic india and the new world order we are eagerly waiting to hear from you sir uh, please sir now the platform is all yours uh, thank you very much yes, at the outset uh, i must uh, thank and congratulate um, center for ethnic studies and research uh, cesr uh, guwahati assam for organizing this uh, webinar uh, days of webinar week, week long webinar to deliberate on the issue of governance and development particularly you know when we see the whole narrative of governance and issues of development uh, from the indian point of view we feel very often uh, sometimes we feel very happy and sometimes unhappy happy that we are a large country we are a democratic country we are a functional democracy and governing process is by and large uh, uh, not bad we are unhappy that uh, many of our instruments of governance are not uh, fulfilling the mandate uh, you know they are supposed to be fulfilling so we have lot of prospects possible we have lot of challenges also associated with us inherent and uh, part of it and uh, i must thank uh, professor satpathi for setting the tone for the for the whole dialogue narrative to happen on governance and uh, development now i come from uh, international relations background and uh, fortunately or unfortunately or incidentally i also teach uh, you know international trade and development and development economics and some part of maritime economics also i look at it so i have migrated to be a interdisciplinary uh, scholar 
and that's where uh, i will combine my my understanding and experience in analyzing what i see governance and development in the context of india as it stands today now if at all we look at uh, now india and uh, today's time particularly in our days ago we had a you know bloody uh, confrontation with china it was very unfortunate and there was fatality also both sides and all that so governance and development when i look at it i look at it from the international perspective as to the time frame in which we are standing today we are standing today at a crossroad international uh, you know, transition time and a very uh, you know very very creative crossroad that is uh, that has arrived uh, that is right in front of us you know from the point of view of several uh, you know ways the the scheme of transition is happening in many ways the international security order that is in great great transition there is a rising power china and the 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 status quo power the americans monopoly power they are afraid of losing ground and so they want to contain china and china is on to rising so it is creating stress on the international uh, existing order and the order is an international security order is in transition second if i look at it the other side economic side of the of the you know, global governance then uh, the mode of production that used to be the mode of production uh, till 1990 you know now is in great shift it is shifting from manufacturing economy to your artificial intelligence your computer uh, you know driven cyberspace economies and uh, you know what we call the knowledge economy per se and the methodology of productivity has far to become different like like uh, google doesn't produce anything but google has google connects us all together into several uh, knowledge platforms or uh, ola uber if we look at it sitting in san francisco they are driving their uh, vehicles cars in singapore in thailand in india and in uh, kanyakumari and guwahati also so uh, the manufacturing economy that used to dominate uh, world economic uh, world economy and the mode of productivity has now shifted to knowledge economy and that's where you know india also has to be realistic and respond to the changes third uh, major change that is happening is that uh, corresponding to the international changes transitions that are happening old international institutions are also under stress so at the global level when we look at it united nations for that matter is 75 years old and anything that is 75 years old tends to be uh, old enough to respond to the new dynamics or respond to the new changes that that are occurring in these days so united nations or be it world bank or many of the britain wood uh, institutions my understanding is that they are under great, great stress united nations you know particularly the the uh, the permanent member p5 you know they do not necessarily represent the political geography of uh, of the world today you have brazil you have india you have japan you have germany you have many countries australia and many countries in the world including mexico vietnam number of countries that that have emerged in a big big way and they not only want to aspire to be part of the united nations uh, governing process but also the demand so it's because their economic weight has increased so substantially that you cannot ignore them in response to the to the radical uh, you know aspirations of uh, emerging countries new institutions are also emerging in the international space space like brics for that matter brics has no geographic connectivity brazil russia india china south africa they spread all over the world but uh, you know james o'neil you know imagined that these are the countries who are uh, the prospective countries of the world economic order so they are a formation so you have a brics you have apec you have cvet you have number of such uh, countries or combinations they are emerging in the international space in addition to that if we look at world bank for that matter world bank used to have a monopoly you know control on the disbursement of the loans and the development narratives of many of the countries of the world to compete with world bank we have now uh, aiib you know china leads the bank you know asian infrastructure investment bank that is virtually to to tell the world bank that your time is up and the new banking system new banking order is necessary so you have uh, you know the mode of productivity is changing 
the international security climate and the order is, uh, is in transition and the institutional formats of the world is also changing. It is in that condition when we, when I look at India in terms of governance and uh, development narrative, I look at it both at the international space, the, the dynamic changes of uh, dynamic changes that are happening in the governance module and the aspirations India has and what possibly India needs to do or concentrate and that's what is my focus uh, uh, in correlating India's prospect of uh, governance and development in the transition times, both globally at the international level and at the national level. Now, if I want to capture the global transition and then uh, we have to, people call it as globalization, that you have to look at the global space and respond from the local level. That way, if I look at it, how do I capture the international uh, you know, transition times? two broad uh, formats from the School of International Relations. I mean, you would find them very popular. That one is a realist school. The other one is a liberal school. The realists are all more uh, power centric. They feel that uh, you know China is rising and there's a great amount of confrontation is uh, expected. The Americans, uh, the uh, existing superpower will demand status quo to be maintained. And that's where they will try to contain China and it leads to conflict. And uh, the popular terminology for that is Thucydides trap. Uh, Graham Allison, Professor Graham Allison uh, coined the term called uh, Thucydides trap. Uh, Professor Graham Allison is in uh, Harvard uh, Kennedy Center. And uh, borrowing from the Greek uh, you know, um, classical times history, he uh, talked about the coined the word called, uh, uh, called Thucydides trap. That largely talks about that there's a new power that is coming in the town. The old powers will resist the rise of the new power and a tussle, a military conflict or containment process is definite and that's where it is expected to happen. So the realists, they look at it, a power, balance of power uh, you know, syndrome to emerge a conflict, a war and uh, a lot of uh, challenging competitiveness that they imagine. And along with Graham Allison, if I can club, you have Samuel Huntington, you have Francis uh, Fukuyama, you have John uh, Miyasemiar, you have Kindleberger, Alistair Ryan, Johnston, and number of them, they are all really schools. They look at, they see that uh, there's a huge conflict coming. And if at all there's a conflict coming, then India has to position, we have no choice. We have the first hand experience, the first opening uh, when, um, uh, introductory experience that happened in uh, Galbanso River Valley. And we have already, so we have to be uh, to be conflict prepared. The other side of the Thucydides trap is the is the you know, uh, liberal school, which talks about the rising phenomena of a great uh, great convergence world order. Number of them there, there Richard Baldwin. Richard Baldwin is currently is uh, professor of economics at uh, Geneva School of Economics. Then you have uh, other political scientists. Uh, Joseph Nye talked about soft power. Robert Cohen talked about uh, interdependence of great powers. Asok Mebubani, former Singapore diplomat and uh, dean of uh, Lee Kuan E Institute of uh, Public Policy. Uh, Kevin Rod, Amita Bacharya from India. All of them, they are the liberal school representatives or protagonists. They talk about that no conflict is not the, not the uh, you know, possibility. Rather, there's a great amount of convergence, interdependence that is happening. Amita Bacharya, when I put it as, there's a, there's a formation of multiplex world order that is greatly rising in the, in the world system. What we mean by multiplex world order is that uh, when we go to a multiplex, you have not a single uh, screen is there, but several screens are operating at the same time. You can see several movies, movies are there. Uh, Amita Bacharya talks about that uh, world has moved into such amount of interdependence that nobody can afford to create hegemony and that's why it is a time of multiplex that everybody has to conflict and cooperation has to exist together and that's what he called calls it as a uh, multiplex world order richard baldwin on the other hand he creates a uh, far too different uh, perspective from the from uh, the economics point of view he talks about uh, the rising uh, you know 1990s economic globalization as a phenomena of uh, fourth industrial revolution phenomena where the manufacturing economy of the earlier times gave way to the uh, the rising uh, phenomena of what you call the knowledge economy telecomputing 
or uh, the example that I gave uh, that uh, Ola over they're operating every, everywhere in the world and some people are sitting in San Francisco, they're managing the operation of it. Google for that matter or many such organizations, they do not really, you know, uh, the Ola Uber owners or uh, you know, entrepreneurs are not taxi manufacturers or taxi promoters, but they have put together through algorithm, uh, through, uh, algorithm, through artificial intelligence, have put a system in place that is helping the productivity or operation of economies in many parts of the world, be it Google or in economics, you can call it as the FANG economy. FANG economy largely represents what we call, you know, Facebook, uh, A for FANG, F, A for, uh, um, um, uh, you know, Netflix, Google and uh, Facebook and Amazon. Facebook, Amazon, Netflix and Google. If you put them together, you know, none of them produce anything, but they are all billionaires or dealing with billion, uh, with a trillion dollars of economies all over the world, most impactful uh, you know, uh, development. And that's what uh, Baldwin talks about, that the mode of production of the world has changed and the knowledge economy has opened up several, several opportunities. But two prominent things uh, Baldwin talks about is that what the knowledge economy did is that earlier, North America and Europe used to be wealthy because of the control on the manufacturing economy. But when the knowledge economy came, the capitalist world is now integrating with the labor cheap developing countries, labor markets, and accordingly they're outsourcing the jobs and productivity to the third world country, to the, to the developing countries and, and so on. And that's where Baldwin says that if at all China, Indonesia, Mexico, Brazil, or India, they have become uh, rich in the last uh, 20, 30 years, it's because the North American capital integrated with the, with the developing countries labor force and they produced elsewhere. So what it delivered is that it uh, de-industrialized some of the old industrialized economies or developed economies took away some of their prosperities and it delivered prosperity to countries like India, Brazil, China, and Indonesia, and, and so on. So that way, if we, if we look at it, I think great uh, dynamic things are happening uh, now in the international system and India has to position itself. And that's where if we look at it, you have a number of uh, terminologies that are available, Thucydides trap, Kindle burger's trap, Tacitus trap, middle income trap, and in the liberal school side, you have great convergence, you have multiplex world order, great power inter interdependence and, and so on. Now, where does India stand or uh, position itself? How are we to manage the governance and development for today and for the coming times? That's what is my agenda of, uh, you know, uh, of interaction. Now, uh, two perspectives I talked about, Thucydides trap and great convergence. I'll come to the third perspective. I'm greatly influenced by this uh, man, uh, uh, Mackinder, Hufford John Mackinder. 1943, Mackinder uh, wrote the last article of his life and uh, that was published in Foreign Policy. On request, he wrote the article. And I uh, read the, some, of, some parts of the article that where he says, that the monsoon lands of India and China, the article was written in 1943 when World War was still on and India and China they were nowhere in the global power uh, in our configuration. And that's the time he's writing this article. So it is at least 70 years old article. So he says the monsoon lands of India and China holding a thousand million people of ancient oriental civilization that will grow to prosperity and balance the remaining great geographical regions in the world. They must grow to prosperity in the same years in which Germany and Japan are being tamed to civilization. They will then balance the other thousand million people who live between the Missouri and the Yangtze River. Yangtze River is in Russia. And he says, feels happy to say that a balanced globe of human beings and happy because balanced and thus free. Uh, I emphasize greatly on Mackinder's uh, you know, vision 70 years ago, where he says that the monsoon lands of India and China will rise and rise to prosperity. And then he says, second part of it, that they will balance the world order and world will be more balanced, uh, globe of human beings and happy because balanced and thus free. Now, uh, friends, we stand at a point of time when, uh, you know, as per Mackinder's imagination, India and China have indeed uh, emerged in a big way. Unfortunately, however, 
uh, now, uh, China's rise uh, in the international space has uh, virtually disrupted, uh, created disruption in the world order itself, and the Americans are, are uh, lock, stock, and barrel open to contain China in many, many ways. And we see the see the manifestations of it in variety of ways. So, what is left of Mackinder's imagination is India. And when he says, uh, Mackinder says that uh, thousand million people with the civilizational values and order, that's where. I look at it, okay, what India is, and how does it present itself with its uh, thousand million people when I say it is a large market, it's a huge country, democratic country, and that's where I connect the governance and issues of development, and uh, how is it uh, going to unfold. I will carry the story uh, in two ways, two uh, empirical evidence, and uh, in this map you can see I have your mark is that uh, there's a uh, Chabahar port in Iran that is being identified here from Mumbai and the other side from Chennai port to Bangladesh uh, seaport you can you can see here I have clarified. This is uh, I'm giving one empirical evidence uh, to to talk about is that uh, this is a graph of uh, Chabahar port in operation and when Chabahar port uh, was initially the contract was signed Pakistan was not very happy to hear about it and many of the Pakistani channels, they carried uh, you know, coverage that if at all Chabahar becomes operational, then Karachi port would lose 50% of its business. That's what attracted my attention to, to look at exactly, you know, if at all Chabahar port is impacting the, the functioning of uh, Karachi port. Now, Chabahar port became operational uh, on, uh, on uh, October 2017, it became operational. And after that, we have taken the, the vessel movement in the ports to Chabahar and Karachi port uh, together. You can see it is a, a nearly two years uh, data that I have combined together. I didn't uh, get, uh, you can see the red portion, bottom portion of it, the numbers are all cargo vessels. These are all vessel-wise mapping has happened. All seven types of vessels have been mapped together. And if you look at it, the, uh, the bottom line ones, red ones, 401, 412, 408, two it's coming to 447 and all that. What exactly it has happened, the cargo vessels coming to Karachi port has declined, not 50%, but 23%. I consider it as a great story of India's strength, not fighting with the Pakistanis, but creating your own infrastructure in a third party country like uh, like Iran, that it, it nullifies uh, Pakistan's ability to, to conflict with you. We don't have to really fight, waste your bullets and all that. You know, rather develop your economies and efficiency elsewhere, which uh, negates the Pakistani arrival and, and, and all that. That's a great story. That's a very uh, success story of India. Of course, Jabahar port has, is running into, into conflict these days, uh, in, into speculations these days, but I'm not greatly afraid of that speculation. This is a story I'm taking. I'm talking about another story, the, the other story. This is a story of uh, Singapore port, the bigger, uh, man, um, size this side you can see is the Singapore port functioning efficiency of Singapore port or the number of vessels Singapore port handled in two years time 750 days time and this is all together the smaller one all together there are 72 ports the number of vessels they handled in two years time what is the 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 finding here that Singapore is a small island nation has only one seaport and that's a critical maritime uh, strategic infrastructure for them. And it has created what we call the economic superpower called Singapore. And uh, in the real time, these are all real time data. So nobody can uh, challenge my, my data. I mean, I, I can, uh, my, um, the finding is that Singapore port, one single port that handles close to 3000 vessels every day. India, on the other hand, 72 functional ports are there in India and all of them put together per day, they handle roughly about 800 vessels. That means it's a great country like India, you call it the way you like to, but if we, when we look at the productivity of our infrastructure or productive units, economic units of productivity, then what happens is that a small country, it's an island nation like Singapore, their one seaport is four times, close to four times more efficient than all the seaports put together. All the seaports put together, that's where the tragedy is. That we have the prospect, ability, desire 
to showcase Chabahar kind of a example where you can nullify the international uh, you know, uh, conflicts in variety of way in favor of India. But we have the internal story where internally we are so shrunk, so underproductive and so limited that we do not compare with, uh, with, uh, with a small country like uh, island country like uh, Singapore's efficiency in one sector and all that. So when I look at it, I think uh, structurally, if you look at it, you know, this is uh, India, uh, China, and uh, Japan. I'm just giving a glimpse of Japan. If you look at it, these are the icons that you see, whole of Japan. I've tried to put the, the seaports as they are. You know, I put the icons of the seaports in Japanese map, and you can see they have 878 seaports. They are all functional. China has 156 seaports, they are all functional and Shanghai port is far too more efficient. And India, though you see 124 seaports depicted here, actually 72 of them are functional and none of them are large enough or medium enough. They're all small and uh, ports and largely inefficient and, and so on. I'll just quickly go past in the interest of time. This is a distribution of uh, what you call uh, the, the uh, you know, um, uh, uh, the Indian Ocean Rim Association uh, countries, coastline and seaports uh, distribution. This is uh, my own graph. And if you see, I have tried to capture 44 countries in the region, starting from the east coast of uh, Africa to up to Australia, Oceania, and, and so on. And you have 44 countries spread in three continents. And you have combined uh, population is four uh, billion population, I mean, a uh, great amount. Number of seaports are there, 221 seaports are there in all these areas put together. Now, if you subdivide, look at it, out of that 200, 721 seaports, East Asia, Southeast Asia has 56% of the seaports. Oceania, Oceania is Australia and New Zealand, they have 21%. Africa 11%, Gulf 6%, and South Asia, which is the largest chunk of landmass in this region with uh, you know, so much of uh, sea, sea coast, has only 6% of the seaports available. Seaports is a critical gateway to your productivity, export, import, uh, uh, you know, traveling to the international market, your access to the international market, and, and so on. Now, I move to, that's, that's about the seaports and uh, now I come to another sector just to carry the story that I look at the agriculture sector. India continues to have nearly 50% of India's uh, you know, labor force today are in the agriculture, 50%. And the size of pre-COVID uh, you know, labor market size in India is roughly about 566 million people. They are working in India. And in contrary, in China, nearly 900 people are working. Very strangely, I mean, very, very surprising that if at all we look at the arable land that is available to India, China, Japan, Thailand, China and uh, India, I'm just comparing. We have India has more arable land available than China. China is a big country, but we have more arable land. Rice area harvested in million hectares, if we put again, we are cultivating more land, uh, more Arab um, rice land than China. But when we convert that into the productivity process, where is India? India is coming in the fifth, last, last but one space, and China and other countries are far ahead. We have more agriculture land. We, ha we have more land. We have more agriculture land. We are more cultivating them also. But what we produce is nearly half of what China produces per unit of land. Per unit of land, we produce much, much less. That's a, that's a structural limitation. We have the resource that that's a case of being uh, very poor with all your resources. But that's very, very unfortunate uh, about it. Now, when I look at the labor market, labor market uh, is a very strange uh, phenomena that we have 1,337 million people living today. And uh, out of that, you know, population is uh, 1,337 million people. Out of that, 566 million people, that's the pre-COVID uh, you know, labor market size, that many people work in India. And compared to China, you know, uh, China's 900 million people are working. That means cool 300 million more people are working in China. And you can see the graph here. 
you know, ours is nearly 41% of the population is in the working space, whereas China's is uh, 59 and, and so on. So what we mean by that, that this is a structural anomaly that we have the land, we are cultivating them also, but we are producing far less. What it means is that we have not invested on the, on the infrastructure to be productive, neither in the maritime sector that is in glare, that is glaringly visible, nor in the, you know, so green revolution or no revolution, you know, if your resources are underproductive, then that's, that, you know, nobody can help you. Now, I'll, uh, you know, now how do we position India in this kind of a, you know, scenario that India stands at the global uh, crossroads of opportunities. I uh, tell it with responsibility that, uh, you know, not only India is the largest, uh, you know, democracy in the world with, uh, you know, religious freedom, free press, judiciary and all, these are all virtues that India has. In addition to that economic specter, if we have the virtues, we have 1.37 billion buyers in India who buy every day, including me, all of us present here in this uh, webinar. Nearly 15 million mobiles get sold every month in India. Every month, close to 15 million mobiles. And Sri Lanka's population is roughly about 20 million. So we are as much, you know, 15 million televisions get sold in India per annum. 4.4 million cars or cars for, and uh, commercial vehicles get sold per annum also. So what Mackinder imagined at that point of time is that India is a huge country with a sizable population, with a value-based society, civilizational order and value order, and they will capitalize on the market strength of India. And since civilization is the value guiding parameter, India will be the balancing, para balancing force in the world order. Unfortunately, what is happening in spite of all the economic uh, strength that we have, we are not correlating it with negotiating uh, negotiating our space in the international system. United Nations Security Council, we not, need not have to be invited. We demand a position is an undeniable proposition. Nobody can stop India. But unfortunately, we have not negotiated in that strength, that ability, as a result of which in the global governance phenomena, India is uh, is remaining, playing a second fiddle. We got to, got to get together there and uh, propose. So what is uh, my... So there's some, uh, three critical things that needs to happen that link India's purchasing power to demand reciprocal global space. We must demand, we're not a small country. Second thing that is happening is that as we saw the port sector, the land uh, agriculture sector and all that, that we got to increase the institutional efficiency of every institution in the in the country, be it agriculture, be it the universities, be it uh, Mackinder. Mackinder was the director of London School of Economics. He wrote a theory in 1900, 1904, and today I think n number of people are working on on his theory. The directors of prominent developed countries uh, institutions have been have been institutions themselves have been thought leaders. Most of the directors in developing countries, unfortunately, have been grown old as a result of which they have landed as director and they are senior professor because they are old enough to be senior. They cannot be junior anymore, not by virtue of the ideas. And that's where, unless we redefine the mandate of each and every institution of India, be it the seaports, be it the land, agriculture, uh, be it the police station, the universities, everywhere, and economic globalization demands only one thing, that you be efficient and be profitable in the market. If you are not efficient, nobody cares for you. Market is a ruthless instrument. It will just uh, you know, relegate you out of the market itself. And that's where third thing is that we must chart out our short term, medium, medium term and long term goals with fixed mandate for institutions. And efficiency, as we move further, efficiency is the only, only be it political efficiency, economic efficiency, thinking efficiency, institutional efficiency. Efficiency is the only mantra through which we can we can have our uh, space in the global level, and we can really have the right development strategy and experience in India at the hinterland at the internal level. Uh, with that, uh, you know, I think I have, I have concluded my my understanding of uh, my proposition. Thank you very much for inviting me for this um, discourse. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Parhan, sir, for your nice and um, thorough analysis of this uh, topic, India and New International Order. 
uh, you have uh, very well uh, explained it very well in a systematic manner within a short period of time. It's really thought provoking and thorough deliberation. And you have uh, beautifully explained about the international world order and India's stand as well as uh, India's stand in agricultural sector and also labor market sector and what India should do uh, to make the, uh, this stand more powerful. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, today, uh, in this valedictory session, we are very fortunate and happy and feel honored that we have with us our um, Professor D.B. Subedi, sir, as our special guest. I welcome you, sir, to this valedictory session. And before your speech, I would like to introduce you um, before our presentation, uh, participation, participants. And Professor D.B. Subedi is postdoctoral research fellow and faculty of humanities, arts, social sciences, and education, University of New England, Australia. Professor Subedi sir has an interdisciplinary academic background, specializing in political sociology and peace studies. Before joining in University of New England, Sir worked as a lecturer in the School of Government, Development, and International Affairs at the University of the South Pacific in Fiji. Sir is also a senior fellow at the Center for Security Governance in Canada. Professor Shubedi Sir worked with international organizations for more than 10 years. Uh, I would also like to admit that Professor Shubedi Sir um, always respond to our mail very quickly and Sir has readily agreed to be present in this valedictory session. Really Sir, it is an honor for us and we are very happy that you have, uh, you are present in this session and your present made this event successful one. Now I request Professor Shubedi Sir to uh, present his speech, deliver his speech. Um, Thank you. Professor Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Bondita. Did I pronounce your name correctly? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Bondita. Yes, sir. Yeah, good. Thank you. Thank um, you, thank you um, the Center for Ethnic Studies and Research, for inviting me to this very important um, seminar today. And I'm, I, I'm really uh, pleased to, uh, you know, be here and share this platform with uh, so many distinguished scholars and participants from India and possibly from uh, other countries as well. First of all, um, um, uh, I would also like to mention that I, I really get excited about this program when I received this invitation, you know, uh, also because of my um, current and past work with ethnic minorities in South Asia. Um, I, I must admit that. So I have been working on uh, ethnic issues in South Asia, particularly when it comes to development, but when it comes to conflict, security, human rights kind of issues, uh, I have worked with uh, ethnic groups, both majority and minority groups in Sri Lanka, for example, uh, in Nepal, uh, in Myanmar and, and, and some other parts of um, Asia. Um, so I really like the focus of your organization and, and your work, uh, and I'm here today, thank you. Um, the topic for this seminar today is quite interesting. Um, interesting in the sense that it brings uh, two very complex concepts, I would also say areas of study together, you know, development, and governance. Um, in fact, the concept of development in itself is so broad and vague, and so is governance, you know. <laughs> uh, but as I said, these are interrelated, and you did the right thing to bring these together because much of the discussion about development, the contemporary trajectory of development in Asia, but also in the so called third world, um, is actually looked at from the lens of governance. So I'll try to do the justice to this, to the overall um, theme of this, uh, of this um, uh, seminar today. Uh, 
My approach to uh, look at development, especially in South Asia, is, is what I call a critical approach. I take a critical approach because uh, let me start by sharing three important figures from what's happening in the world today. We have a history of almost 70 years of international development or so-called development. It's been almost 70 years since the idea of development has been uh, you know, conceived and development has become a, 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 a space, an area of both research and practice. However, in the last 70 years, if we look back, you know, and then focus on what the world has achieved at a global scale, uh, is something really pessimistic, you know, because almost 8 million people today in the world live under the poverty line, international poverty line, according to uh, United Nations recent figures. 10% of the world's population live under extreme poverty and, and also suffer from uh, hunger at the same time. Um, in the world, armed conflicts and civil war has been associated with, you know, people's grievances around the economic opportunities, development, or more specifically under development. And as a result of that, at, uh, at, you know, at present, there are 68.5 million people who have been forcefully displaced from their, uh, from, their, from their home, home countries and homelands. And interestingly, a significant number of these, uh, you know, uh, people um, uh, in this forced uh, uh, migrants categories are ethnic minorities from within their own countries. So what's happening in the, in the world of development in the last 70 years? Why we haven't been able to, uh, you know, make a significant way forward? I mean, I'm not saying that there has been no progress so far made in the world. There has been, uh, you know, uh, some good progress that have been made in the world. For example, child mortality rate has been reduced across the, you know, because of the modern uh, medications and, and, and the health system. Um, you know, uh, in certain countries, there is, there is a notable growth, uh, economic growth. But then the question is, is that all development or are we really, you know, uh, lagging far behind than where we should have been in terms of development in the world today? So that's a very important question. Uh, and perhaps it's, it's a million dollar question to, to answer. Uh, but what I would say is that why there is a persistence underdevelopment in the words of American President Harry Truman, who coined this term underdevelopment in 1947, and from which point onward, a new um, internationalized discourse of development is started based on the idea of global cooperation, globalism, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, um, and international cooperation. But then why underdevelopment is persisting in the world today? This is my answer to that question in, in one sentence is, um, I would consider development or so, more specifically under development, the opposite side of the coin, under development as a political phenomena, as much as it is social and economic phenomena. And why is it political phenomena? Because if we look at development just from the perspective of economic growth, then it gives us a false picture. You know, because if we look at different countries in even in South Asia, in the last 10 or 20 years, there has been some notable economic growth. And that is because of the use of modern technology, technology transfer from the uh, you know, developed countries to the developing countries, because of education, because of uh, reduced mortality rate, because of um, you know, uh, increment in human capital. And Professor Pradhan already you know, uh, discussed all these things before. But despite all these things, why we are actually experiencing persistent underdevelopment and why the political system and political leaders are not being able to solve this very important problem is because development is a political phenomenon. It has been politicized to such an extent over the last 200, 300 years. I'm not talking about 10 or 20 years of window frame here because 
the history of under development in my view in the world is the history of politicization of inequality. I'm, I'm, and why, uh, what is the history of politi So um, in, in other words, uh, my argument is that to understand why there is so much underdevelopment in the world today, we need to actually look at the history of at least two, three years before when there, is a, there was the creation of modern state system, when there was a creation of modern technology in human society, along with these new creations, there was a, ten, tra a tradition, there was a tendency that is making the world unequal from the very beginning of human civilization. And it is that inequality that is actually persisting over the time. Okay, well, how does this inequality has been persisting over the time? Let's ha have a look at that. First of all, if we look at the, uh, the development like in the pre-colonial time or even the early, early colonial time, India would was considered as one of the one of the developed economies in uh, in Asia, you know, by by many standards, because India used to have its own self-sufficient, um, you know, cottage industry, rural industry. Bengal was very famous for production of silk that we all know. But why did India, which was already doing so much progress in self-sufficient, uh, small scale? even large scale industrialization, all of a sudden become one of the developing country, even poor country during the colonization period is because the first and foremost very global attempt to create inequality in the world was the process of colonization. Because we all know colonization was a political system which not only created social hierarchies across the world, but it also created, it also exploited, you know, natural resources from one parts of the world to fulfill the economic needs of the people in the other parts of the world. So uh, in that sense, what I'm suggesting here is, you know, if we understand development or, or underdevelopment or lack of development in terms of uh, inequality, the history of inequality has, 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 is rooted in the history of colonization. Even before the history of colonization, we know that there was, there was unequal hierarchy of humanity because there was the, uh, you know, um, global economy. Some, some countries in, in, the, in the Western Europe actually benefited from, for example, slave trade. You know, that was, that was another example of how inequality existed far beyond in 500 years before in, in the human civilization. So, uh, I mean, Professor Pradhan very briefly touched on uh, deindustrialization process. One thing that the colonization, the history of colonization suggests to us is that colonization actually industrialized, helped to industrialize one part of the world, especially in, 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 the, in, the, in, in the worlds, in the, color, uh, in the worlds of colonizers. But then at the same time, it actually decolonized, uh, deindustrialized the, the colonized world. That's how it created a kind of a political system and a kind of economic system that is having its effect for 300, 400 years down, uh, down the line. And actually we, uh, the, the current generation in a way is actually bearing the brunt of that, that inequality which was created many, many years ago. Uh, things changed after the first world war and particularly after the second world war and uh, the world tried to enter into a, a new phase of global solidarity, global uh, cooperation, uh, and basically what we call the idea of globalism and internationalism. I don't want to touch, um, go in detail about the idea of globalization, uh, internationalism and globalism, because uh, Professor Pradhan already discussed, um, you know, uh, true, true, uh, at a greater length on this topic. But what I'm, uh, trying to make uh, a point here is that um, following on from the history of colonization and then the attendant process of deindustrialization and economic exploitation of the third world country, actually globalization, uh, you know, uh, the, the second world war, the post second world war did not actually redress that past injustice at a global scale, 
But what I'm saying is that it actually exacerbated the phenomena in the name of what we know as globalization uh, and, and capitalism, it, its economic and political project. So as a result of globalization, there was, uh, you know, uh, there is a massive flow of um, uh, labor and capitals around the world. And uh, not all countries in the world have been able to exploit the opportunities from uh, globalization in the, in the same manner. For example, uh, you know, one thing that globalization did was oh, that it not right. only globalized the idea and, and the production system, but it also uh, globalized the consumer, right. consumer right. system. So what happened is that some countries become the, uh, become the, um, you know, um, producer in the global um, economy and some other countries just ended up being a consumer in that, in the global international production system. Um, uh, in, in the name of uh, comparative economic advantage and so on and so forth, there was like, you know, sifting of many industries from the uh, global North countries to global South countries, you know, in the developing countries, because the uh, countries in the global South had cheaper labor available uh, to help the uh, production system and make the production system more compatible in the international, competitive international market. But we can see what's happening in the Western Europe today uh, is actually a very uh, powerful reaction to the negative effects of globalization. Because what globalization did in the world, other than bringing opportunities to, especially technology, healthcare, uh, telecommunications, uh, even ideas from one part of the world to other part of the world, we are so much connected today. At the same time, what globalization has done is that it has ex exacerbated the, the, the global inequality. And that global inequality actually replicates at the national and domestic level. You know, for example, if we look at, uh, for example, Sri Lanka or Bangladesh, let's, or Nepal in South Asia, and if we compare their economic, economic um, progress, economic growth and development at a global scale, and if we compare with, for example, countries with high per capita income and, uh, you know, and um, uh, uh, social development, for example, countries in Western Europe or maybe, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, in other parts of the world, there is an inequality. But similar kind of inequality has been actually repl replicated within their countries. For example, if we look at India, you know, despite New Delhi, you know, uh, Mumbai and some other big economic hubs, there are, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 there are states and society is living in the peripheries of India, which have notable uh, socioeconomic inequalities with, um, uh, if we compare it with economic development in the center. So what I'm saying here is that inequality in this world not only exists at a global scale, but that inequality at a global, global scale has been to some extent or even to more extent replicated at the at the national economic level at, at a national level so as a result we have you know people languishing in poverty uh, you know being uh, deprived of health being deprived of educations in the peripheries of even a developing or middle income country whereas the center is actually profiting a lot and and progressing a lot in terms of human quality in terms of economic growth and so on and so forth. So when we think about development in the world today, my, my argument then is that we should also look at inequalities within, within, within the state system, within a country. Uh, for example, we can take example of India. Uh, one thing that I must also highlight when we think of inequality within the nation state is that if we look at the uh, you know, middle income countries or countries that are doing economically uh, uh, good in terms of economic growth. If we look at these countries such as Thailand, for example, or Philippines, even India, these countries have for more than uh, three, four decades, these countries are actually having armed insurgencies and ethnic conflict, you know, going on in their peripheries and in the borderlands. And there are different narratives actually uh, uh, that explains why there has been, uh, you know, um, armed insurgencies, armed conflict, and ethnic grievances going on in the borderlands of Asian countries, which is a common phenomenon. If we look at Myanmar, 
all the armed insurgencies in Myanmar are actually located in the borderlands of Myanmar, right? If we look at Thailand, for example, Thailand has ongoing, uh, you know, um, insurgencies in, in, its, it, in its southern border. Philippines has trouble uh, uh, lands in Mindanao region. There is, um, you know, armed insurgencies going on in Mindanao region for, for almost 50 years now. Sri Lanka used to have armed conflict in its periphery. So why, uh, you know, uh, these countries in, in Asia having conflict in the borderlands is that one reason is that because there is so much inequality between center and periphery and, and the people's frustration, people's grievous, grievances, which is a result of this inequality within the nation state is actually being expressed in the form of armed insurgencies and armed conflict. But unfortunately, these, these, these patterns are being interpreted not from the point of view of socioeconomic inequalities within the nation state, but in many cases, these are being interpreted from the perspectives of national security and so and so forth. And that's why there has not been, you know, notable progress in resolving uh, legitimate and genuine socioeconomic conflicts in the borderlands of most of these countries. That's one thing uh, that I would say is also a product of uh, inequalities within the nation state. Uh, following the era of globalization, which I would say is still continuing, uh, there are two things that have been happening in the world. One, you know, the, the late globalization phase, which I would say in the new millennium phase, when there was this rapid expansion of internet in the world, uh, you know, helped many countries to benefit from the globalization of digital technology. India, uh, you know, Professor Pradhan just mentioned about the number of cell phones, you know, being sold in India, and that's uh, uh, that's an interesting figure in itself. You know, India is an example in South Asia, which is doing remarkable progress in terms of, you know, utilizing digital technology for um, micro enterprises development, for uh, education, for health, and so and so on, many things. But you know, um, if you look at these problems at a, at a global scale, there are also countries in the world which are actually in the receiving end of this. Uh, you know, modern digital technology. You know, th these countries are only becoming the uh, becoming the consumers of the global uh, modern technology. And many countries are not even have the, you know, adequate access to the modern technology because technology in itself is, a, is an expensive thing, right? So what's happening because of this, you know, rapid expansion of digital technology along with globalization is because digital technology is also in a way creating unequal worlds, not only at a global scale, but again, you know, within the, within the, uh, within the nation states. Um, and because of that, um, you know, um, inequality based on digital technology, you know, if we look at today, for example, um, 10 people possess almost half of the world's wealth. Um, and these 10, pe 10 peoples are actually massively benefiting in their enterprises and in their businesses by the use of the technology. But not everybody in the world has this similar um, uh, amount of access to technology because of so many things. Uh, the capital needed to invest in technology, uh, infrastructures, you know, telecommunication, electricity, and so on and so forth. And the, because of that, you know, uh, we are also seeing uh, more people also losing because of uh, rapidly expanding technology as much as they are benefiting. Uh, and I'm using this uh, this argument uh, not to not to not to not to say that you know that modern technology is a bad thing. We all need it. But the thing is, my concern as a social scientist is that rational utilization of modern modern technology. Is, uh, is, is another important thing, I would say. You know, I was just comparing uh, in a rural village of Nepal like a few years back, I was just comparing a family of uh, six people. Uh, almost all are unemployed except, you know, being able to work in their farms for a few months. And all the family members having a cell phone and paying a monthly rent to the, you know, um, telecommunication company you could simply imagine how much is the is the cost of you know uh, the access to 
uh, internet and, and modern technology to that particular family, which doesn't have adequate or enough, you know, income system. So the point here is that as the technology is actually expanding massively and targeting to new consumers around the world, there has not been enough and adequate, uh, you know, uh, opportunities for people actually uh, to grow economically and then be able to actually afford to that modern technology. So in a way, from very micro level to at an international level, even technology also has its both positive and uh, you know, negative sides. Uh, so from a governance point of view, perhaps we need to actually look at how we can actually maximize the benefit of this technology and minimize its, its, um, you know, its negative impacts in the society. We can go on and on and talking about the negative side of technology, you know, cyber bullying, harassment, which also has mental health impact and that also ultimately impacts some people's ability to perform economically uh, you know and maintain social cohesion in a society that are host um, there are a number of many other issues uh, but in short i think from a governance point of view technology is a boon for the modern society but i think we need to also uh, think about it very carefully uh, so um Okay, so when we talk about look at development or underdevelopment from the perspective of global and local inequalities, uh, then how, how can we actually tackle it from the point of governance? Now I want to shift you know, uh, my talk to, a, to, to the question of governance. How, how we can actually address this, this problem uh, at, a, at a local level? Because the question of inequality, development, um, you know, these are because these are political also political phenomena as much as social and economic phenomena that are always question of power and authority involved in it. And, um, uh, and earlier, um, uh, Professor um, uh, uh, mentioned about the question of how local leaders, our leaders are actually, you know, um, using you know, power and authority to make meaningful changes at the community level in their constituencies and so and so forth. I think that's a very important, that's a very brilliant point to make because when we talk about development, uh, I'm not using the term development in a very minimalist sense, which is just as a, as a, um, as a kind of economic growth. Uh, I, I would actually use it in a maximalist sense in which development is, uh, is um, not just economic growth, but development is also uh, brings a kind of situations where people feel dignified, people's material, social, political, and emotional needs are actually addressed simultaneously. That's the kind of approach what Amartya Sen has taken uh, in his book, uh, where he talks about the, the rights-based approach to development, because Amartya Sen thinks that Development is impossible without, you know, gu guaranteeing human rights and social justice. That's one of one of his key arguments. And uh, we cannot actually um, achieve social justice and and fulfill um, the human rights aspects of development unless we address the question of inequality. So that's where I think we can link up the inequality approach to. Um, you know, Amar, Amartya Sen's um, uh, social justice approach uh, to development. So how can actually uh, local governance or governance as a system of, as, 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 a, as a political and institutional system of the state can actually empower people to, uh, to um, uh, think of their own development, work on their own development and achieve a development because what we have to understand is that development is in my view it's it's more of an achievement an outcome end goal rather than a process so how we can achieve that end goal is perhaps yes of course governance also uh, has an important role to play but i think first and foremost thing from governance point of view is that oftentimes when we talk about governance and development we tend to forget about power relations because you know, uh, in, in every society, not every, you know, every people have same amount of social and political power. And always you know, local development agendas are being hijacked by very powerful people. And that's where the problem of 
governance and development lies. So I think apart from inequality, in my view, the next important concept to approach development at, at different labels is also to look at the question of power. And with the question of power, there is also a question of authority and question of participation. Uh, what we are trying to do uh, in the modern discourse of development is that enhancing people's participation in the local decision-making process. Uh, even, you know, in South Asia, the societies are very much hierarchical. You know, we, we have uh, this classical anthropological notion of patron-client relationship exist, still exist in South Asia, you know, because some political leaders are being seen as the patron of their society and their voter banks and their constituent people in their constituencies are often seen as uh, their clients. So there is oftentimes this unequal relationship to uh, that, that comes out of this patron client relationship. And to some extent, if we look at the, the electoral politics in Asia, I'm talking about India, Bangladesh, uh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and many other countries in Asia, we have this continuation of this patron client relationship in our cont contemporary politics. And the same kind of patron client relationship also is perpetuating in what is called the so-called modern engineized concept of development. And this is where I have a problem, you know, because if we want to, if we try to projectize our development, local development discourse, then again, I think we are uh, taking away uh, you know, uh, people's rights and people's privilege to make a decision of their own development at the local level. And we are actually shifting that privilege to the hands of few people who control the development agenda. So the real key, if you understand development at a local level for me is to analyze very micro level of power relations and power dynamics. How does that matter? You know, for example, who decides when to build a school? Who decides when to build an irrigation canal, you know, who decides how much women should be participating in the local parliament, for example, you know, who decides how many ethnic people should be representing from X and so and so constituencies. So these kind of things are actually, uh, these are the idea of modern democracy. Uh, modern democracy is the best available system. It is not the, uh, you know, uh, panacea on the earth. It is not the, uh, you know, um, uh, the best, uh, best of the best thing, but this is the best available system of government, uh, which we have available in the modern world. So how does actually power operates within the local system? How does it operate at the, at, at different labels uh, and how it creates um, um, or closes opportunities for people to participate in local development is uh, uh, very important. Uh, at the same time, uh, I would want to conclude my, uh, my long talk actually uh, by a note that what I said until now is my observations based on my research in the world before the pandemic. We, are, we need a separate discussions to talk about how this current pandemic, COVID-19, is actually going to radically transform and radically alter our understanding of development in modern world. Just very few examples. Until before the pandemic hit the world, we have seen the urban spaces as the space of economic liberation. That's why people used to migrate from rural areas to urban space, because all these work uh, environment, you know, economic opportunities, production system, and so on and so forth were actually located in the urban area. So people all of a sudden become disenchanted in the local agrarian based production system in the villages and people migrated in the rural area. When the pandemic hit, we saw thousands and thousands of people marching months, several days, even months to go back to their villages. So one thing this pandemic is actually teaching the human society is to rethink this, you know, urban rural, uh, you know, urban rural divide in the name of development and economic opportunities. And let people think that what development really means in the post pandemic world. 
one thing that I can see, it's a very early, early, um, it might be too early to make this conclusion, but what I have seen is that even like developed countries like Australia has started talking about, you know, globalization in terms of technology, but localization in terms of economic self-sufficiency. Because as we have seen, long distance value chain, which the globalization promoted in the world, hasn't worked. You know, in Australia, we, we eat banana coming from Latin America. You know, we, we eat uh, fruits coming from parts of Asia. We eat masala spices coming from India, for example, you know, uh, tea coming from Sri Lanka. And so other countries are doing, you know, Chinese, are, Chinese people were eating um, Australian beef and wine and so and so forth. But this long distance value chain, which was created and was made possible because of globalization and, and, and the advancement of the technology has all of a sudden been disrupted. Now, countries are actually looking options to shorten the value chain. You know, how, how can we be self-reliant in terms of our everyday needs, at least in terms of our, you know, um, uh, our economic, you know, and material needs on a daily basis. That is what the countries are trying to rethink. And what does that mean in terms of development is actually it's forcing us to rethink what is already called as localization. So probably this is the time to shift from globalization discourse to sort of a new localization discourse. Uh, having said that, we cannot totally disregard, you know, uh, or reject the globalization discourse because we have to depend on uh, on globalization for so many things, not least because of um, technology in the first place. Because, you know, one thing about uh, globalization is that it transfers technology from one country to another country, uh, uh, you know, uh, and so and so forth. But probably we should not rely too much in terms of rice production, in terms of, for example, you know, meat production, in terms of milk production, uh, to places which has far away from from our localities. So this, per perhaps we are actually entering into the world of very careful globalization and very uh, sensitive localization process. And I hope this will actually uh, help us to rethink about how we can actually think of reducing inequalities through local governance system, which might make the world more equal. And probably we might be able to solve the development uh, development puzzle that the world hasn't been solved for the last 70 years. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Professor D.B. Subedi, sir, for your excellent presentation. Um, in a very short period of time, you have um, explained very well uh, about globalization, uh, localization, and development, as well as about the uh, root cause of uh, underdevelopment, that is inequality. You have truly said that there is uh, the term uh, development as well as governance are closely interlinked to each other. You have also mentioned that the history of politicization is on the root of inequality, which has been persisting from human civilization, and also development as well as the issue of underdevelopment. It is rooted in the history of civilization. And you have uh, beautifully explained about the process of globalization, pros and cons of globalization, and how we can shift from globalization to localization. Uh, thank you very much, sir. And I think our participants, as well as our respected guests, all are uh, immensely benefited by your lecture, uh, immensely benefited your, by your speech. And we have learned a lot from you. And I feel like hearing from you uh, much more, but because of a sort, uh, because we are in the uh, end part of this valedictory session. So uh, I hope that we will hear from you in near future too. And thank you so much, sir, one again, once again. Thank you, thank sir. You. Thank you uh, now I, uh, yes, sir, thank you. Uh, now I request Dr. Dependas, organizing secretary of this workshop to present a brief summary of the um, six of our 16 technical sessions of this workshop. Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Dependas. Yes, uh, very good afternoon to all of you. 
Honorable Chairperson of this session, Professor Kugan Dasar. Honorable Guest of Professor R.P. Pradhan Sir from Beach Pidani Goa Campus. And Professor D.B. Subedi Sir from University of New England, Australia. And all the participants present here. At the very outset, I would like to welcome you all to this valedictory session. Now I'm going to present before you a brief summary of this 70 long international workshop on governance and development issues and challenges. This workshop is being organized by Center for Ethnic Studies and Research in collaboration with Center for, sorry, it's a collaboration with Indian Council of Social Science Research and in association with Department of Political Science, Murhuli College Dhemaji and Mohan Sanda Mohanto Aithyan Gobekana Kendra, Sinamara College, Zurhat. This workshop, so far as these technical sessions are concerned, apart from this into, uh, inaugural session and con uh, validatory session, the workshop was divided into 16 technical sessions. So far as this inaugural session is concerned, in the inaugural session, Professor A.K. Mohapatra from uh, JNU, the Dean the School of International Studies, as well as a member of ICSSR New Delhi. He has attended the workshop as an inaugurator, as well as a chief guest. And Professor R.K. Satpati, Honorable Director of ICSSR and ERC Silong, has attended the inaugural session as a keynote speaker. And Professor Zazati Patnayak also attended the workshop as a uh, guest of honor of the inaugural session. And in the technical sessions that we have in the workshop, we have, as I'm telling you, the 16 resource persons who are there to present their presentation. They are from different parts of the country as well as from abroad also. They have highlighted different aspects of governance and development from their own perspective. Almost all the technical sessions were very interactive. All the resource persons were resourceful and friendly. Most of the participants were also very active and participatory. Overall, the workshop was very fruitful. I hope all the participants have able to learn a lot from our honorable resource persons. Thus, the week-long international online workshop on governance and development coming to an end. With this, I conclude. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dependas. Um, we are also very eager to know the feelings, observations, as well as the learning experiences from our esteemed participants. As of now, we are on seven day of this workshop and I think our participants have acquired uh, some new experiences and also have some observations during this period. So we'd like to hear from few of them. And I request our participants, uh, you can now unmute yourself and please share your experiences and observations. Shall I speak, madam? Oh, see. Yes, ma'am, you can speak. Uh, please give your introduction first. Good evening to all. I'm Dr. Smarita Misra, assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and Public Administration, Annamalai University, Tamil Nadu. I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share my experience. First of all, I would like to point out that it was a very well-organized virtual workshop at this moment when we are all caught up in the COVID pandemic. I can imagine the magnitude of efforts that has been put by the organizers for the smooth conduction of this event. Coming to the topic proper, Governance and development is a major part of our political science curriculum. This international workshop has helped me in gaining new insight from the esteemed resource persons of various fields about the current issues and perspectives. I would like to mention a few topics that I found in interesting are healthcare challenges in the context of COVID-19, environmentalism, ecological governance, and challenges for India, good governance and development with special reference to contemporary crisis. 
and to be honest this workshop was very relevant and informative so thank you once again and i am looking forward to more such events thank you ma'am uh, thank you so much uh, smarita mr ma'am um, any other participants hello uh, yes ma'am uh, can i say something yes ma'am yes definitely um good afternoon everyone respected yes. respected chairperson guest of honor other dignitaries and fellow participants i am imna singh longkumar i am an assistant professor from nagaland a participant of this 7th international workshop it is my privilege to say a few words on my experience as a participant of this international workshop As a participant, I can confidently say that all the resource persons were experts in their own right. All the sessions were informative, interesting, and intriguing. They have enriched our understanding of governance and development, and has enlightened us on the emerging discourse. Personally, I'm very much enlightened about the framework on political crypto biases, which was a very new. a uh, concept for me through the meaningful deliberations with the participants i believe have learned and relearned much from the resource persons both from india and abroad i would also like to thank them for addressing all our queries and clarifying our doubts adequately and very patiently uh, as per my experience i can rightfully say that the organizing committee of this international workshops workshop are efficient and systematic There was timely information, constant updates, and they always addressed our queries and issues promptly, for which we are very thankful. Of course, I understand that this is a team effort, a collaborative work. Therefore, I would like to thank each one, each one of you, including those working behind the scenes, to ensure that we, the participants, have a pleasant and enriching learning experience. I would also like to congratulate. the organizing team for the fruitful and successful completion of this international workshop uh lastly i wish all of us present here today all the very best in all our future endeavors thank you all i uh, thank you so much imraz and the mem uh, for your inspirational words and um, anyone else hello So yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, definitely you can speak. I am. I am Dr. Jolly Bhattacharjee. Okay. I am from Jabi College, Jorhat. It is indeed in the midst of you all. This workshop is a very valuable and interesting workshop, and we are able to acquire more knowledge on the various subjects that is the Fukunama, federalism, globalization, development, locality, etc. and etc. this workshop help us tremendously in our future life as a whole i can comment that this workshop was running in a excellent way thank you for organizing committee thank you all thank you okay thank you very much jolly water pool ma'am for your uh, inspirational words anyone else from our esteem participants Okay, so can I just speak as well? Oh uh, yes, ma'am. You can speak. Okay. Yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Dilly, Doctor Lily Aye <coughs> from Difu Government College, Difu. So, first of all, I want to thank and congratulate the organizing committee for organizing such a wonderful one week international workshop on governance and development issues and challenges to online platform. during this lockdown period do i'm not from political background i have enjoyed and learned so many things it has been such a beneficial workshop for me had it not been through online platform i would not have been able to join due to so many problems the physical or like traveling problem family problem and many other factors but through this online platform i have enjoyed and benefited so much from the resource person 
the organizing committee have meticulously tackled the problem and we have enjoyed a lot. At this point, I would also like to congratulate all the participants for being able to complete this workshop. Thank you, everyone. Hope to meet up either through virtual or face-to-face. -face. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you, ma'am. So we'll meet face-to-face uh, -face after the lockdown period is over. Anybody else? <clears throat> Hello. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Can I speak? Yes, yes. Okay, I'm Ms. Mitali Sunwal, working as an assistant professor in the Department of Education, Manohari Devi Kanoi Girls College. So the workshop has been really very much fruitful for me, right from the relevant topics relating to governance, e-governance, to the impact of globalization, as well as knowing all the various governance related to the Indian perspective and also about Nepal, about the Himalayas, it was noteworthy. So I also thank all the resource persons who were wonderful in their deliberation and have shared utmost information regarding pertinent topics. I also congratulate all the organizers who have organized and maintained uh, the, the quorum of the workshop so wonderfully right from nine, uh, right from uh, the preparation of how to uh, deal with various uh, assignments also. So I'm very much thankful and I have uh, been, uh, I'm blessed and I'm happy to be a participant of this particular workshop. And also I hope that I can attend much more uh, in the future. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Mitali ma'am. And we hope so. Anybody else? I think there will be no more participants. You can go to the next presenter. Uh, I think Divzati Gogoi sir wants to say something. Hello, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, at the very outset, uh, I am very grateful for this seminar. As a participant, I have loved the meetings and a number of problems. And therefore, in this moment, I'd like to comment on this meeting. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, though your voice was not so clear, but I think that you have enjoyed our program. Uh, thank you, uh, Smarita ma'am, Imna Zenla Longkumar ma'am, Jolly Wathapur ma'am, Lily Augustine ma'am, Mitali Sunwal ma'am, and Divzuti Gogoi sir for sharing your valuable thoughts and letting us know about your experiences in the last six days. And your comments and feedback really means a lot for us and it will definitely help us in our future endeavors. Thank you so much again. And after hearing from you, I also feel uh, some kind of emotions in my mind. And after hearing, I feel that uh, in the, it is in the uh, valediction, uh, it is the time that Yale say flurry of emotions and feelings and most of them are pleasant and uh, many of them, uh, some of them may be unpleasant, but everything is a lesson and experiment for us and enjoyment for us. So I also feel that in the last six days, we have made a bond among us and also hope to keep in touch with each other as because we all are from same academic platform. Um, in a lighter note, I also want to add that I am definitely going to miss the phone call uh, at 5 uh, a.m. in the morning uh, regarding your assignments and feedback and the excitements and tensions 
yes sir excitement and tensions uh, especially before and after giving your assignments and feedback feedback in your google classroom it is both of mine and yours uh, the tensions and the whatsapp group conversation and the personal messages regarding your unavoidable situation problem i am really going to miss all of this and will miss you all and i don't know as a coordinator how much i became successful in this workshop but me and all our uh, members we tried our best to make you feel more comfortable and easy going in your uh, learning process in this workshop once once again i thank you all on behalf of entire organizing committee uh, now we have come to the end of this valedictory session i request our share person uh, dr fukon sandor das sir to give his uh, presidential remarks dr das sir Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, Dr. Barbaraman, thank you very much. Uh, this is the end of the seven-day workshop on uh, governance and development issues and challenges. And uh, we have learned a lot of things from the eminent resource persons of national and international perspective. And uh, our participants, they have express their comments and with passion sharing they have participated and they have borne all the uh, uh, interminations also uh, that uh, the organization committee may have and yet they have expressed their satisfaction because they could have known lot of things unknown things from the uh national and international perspective because as we know that today also in the very direct session as i found our three eminent uh, academicians uh, they have given uh, they have delivered their valuable and thoughtful uh, expressions uh, deliberations in the, from the national and international perspective how development can be how how we can develop a nation uh, how we can develop from the international perspective how we can develop from the uh, perspective of economic social and other aspects and uh, industrial aspect so they have discussed elaborately and what i can found that what i have learned that governance and Develop, uh, go, governance and development both are related to the uh, the point of view that um, if there is no good governance then we cannot think of a uh, development if there is uh, no a uh, good governance we cannot think of the success of democracy so uh, participatory democracy a uh, liberal democracy that is the must and our country we do follow that liberal democracy parliamentary democracy then uh, participatory democracy now in practice whether we do follow this participatory democracy or not we have the ingredients of, uh, of this participatory democracy because uh, it should be at the local level grassroots level but what our uh, resource person what our guest they say that participatory democracy the responsiveness that accountability of the uh, of the leaders accountability of the govern government accountability of the bureaucrats these are the must but what we found but our uh, leadership our political leaders our government they are not at all so much of re, 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 accountable to the people because they are more accountable to their political party they have politicized almost all the issues including even including pandemic or even including covid-19 also is that one of our honorable guest he cited that we we should be more concerned now about uh, covid-19 also there should have a 
uh, discussion uh, at this level also. Um, if it is possible, we should organize such a webinar uh, so that we can discuss uh, this pandemic, this, uh, this COVID-19 that has halted our development or not, how it should be tackled. Now we found the leaders, the political leaders, they are trying to politicize the COVID-19 or this pandemic also. Now, so I will not take much more time because our uh, eminent scholars, our resource persons, our guests from nation, national and international, they have delivered more important, more and more important things uh, that have given a lot of information to our participants. Even uh, by this time also, I have come to know a lot of information from them. So I, uh, from, the, from my chair, I would like to convey my heartfelt gratitude to Professor Satpati, Professor Pradhan, Professor Subhiti, and we hope that they will further, uh, in future course of time also, they would surely be extended their uh, the cooperation and participation to us uh, for organizing uh, more such kind of webinars and seminars also. And we further hope that after the situation, that this pandemic situation is over, that when normalcy will come up, uh, we hope of a physical uh, meeting of everyone. And with this reward, I, I, I convey my heartfelt thanks to the uh, convener, secretary of this webinar, to the participants, and to the resource persons, as well as the uh, guests and chief guests, and particularly ICSSR and other organizations who have uh, extended their collaboration and all sorts of assistance. With this reward, uh, I uh, conclude my presidential speech and um, I hand over the uh, charge to the anchor, Dr. Bora. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Phukon Chandra Das, sir, for your inspirational and encouraging words and for also for your guidance during this period of uh, seven days workshop. And I, on behalf of the organizing committee, convey our thanks and gratitude to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, with thank you. all this, oh, yes, sir, thank you. With all this, we come to the end of this valedictory session. And I request Dr. Jogesh Das, the joint coordinator of this workshop, to deliver vote of thanks. Dr. Jogesh Das. Thank you, Bondita, madam. Honorable chairperson, Dr. K.C. Das, sir. Distinguished guests, honorable speakers, and all the esteemed participants. It is my special privilege to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks. At first, we are grateful to today's electricity session, chairperson, Dr. Casey Dassa, for coming and cooperating with us. Give his special speech on the theme of the workshop. Thank you, sir. We are also thankful to chairperson of the organizing committee, Dr. Dipin Swagya, sir who has guided us give valuable solution for conducting this workshop. We are also grateful to Professor Arke Satpati, Regional Director, ICSSR, NERC, for his deliberation and cooperative effort and makes it successful one. A very hearty vote of thanks to the guest of honor, Dr. R.P. Padhansa. It is an immense pleasure for us that you join in our event and bestowed us by being guest of honor. Thank you, sir. I must mention our deep sense of appreciation to invited guest, D.P. Subedi, for his special speech, covers all the major aspects of the theme of the workshop. I would like to thank Dr. Anil Shakya, sir. He is our guide, well sir, and so on. From the very beginning point of time, he encourages us. Again, thank you, sir. I also like to thank all the teaching and non-teaching staffs of Mohidhal College, Dhamaji, and Sinamara College, Zohar, Assam, for giving their support and making it a collaborative practice. I wish to express my gratitude to Dr. Dipendas, Organizing Secretary of Center of Fighting Studies and Research, 
Dr. Pavut Soma, President of CESA, Bondita Bavara, Coordinator of the Workshop, and all the members of the Center for Ethnic Studies and Research for their enormous cooperation in the organization of the event. Last but not the least, I am happy to express a vote of thanks to our all esteemed participants who have blessed us with their presence. We think all of you have benefited from this workshop. Once again, thank you all. Bonita, madam. May I thank you, Doctor. Yes, uh, thank you, Doctor Jugesh Das. And we now at the end of this session, and at last but not the least, I convey my sincere thanks to all the delegates of this session, all the resource persons who cooperated us in the last sixteen technical sessions. Uh, thanks to all the esteemed participants and all the officials of ICSSR, CSR, uh, Sinamora College, as well as uh, Morithal College. And I personally confirm my thanks to Dr. Anil Soikya sir, Dr. Prabhupada Sharma sir, Dr. Dipen Soikya sir, Dr. Dipen Das, Dr. Jogesh Das, Dr. Harad Bora, Mr. Dilip Hazurika, Madam Jusna Hazurika, uh, Professor Deepak Sakraborty sir, Madam Orbita Das ma'am for your endless efforts to make this work, uh, workshop a successful one. And the end of a story is always the beginning for many others. So I hope for the best. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you sir. Much. Thank you.